Hello, everybody. Oh, hello. Haven't seen you in about a month and a half. Thank you for those of you who are coming back. Thank you for those of you who are coming to your first sound waves or to your nth sound waves. It's very nice to see you all here. And we have a really interesting program tonight for you. Our lives, as you know, can be very repetitive. Uh, we go through cycles of activity every day that are very similar from our cornflakes to our glass of wine to our nighttime reading. And we, of course, go through the seasons. So we have our spring, summer, fall, winter, 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 spring, summer, fall. And um, without repetition in our lives, I think it, they would be very difficult actually to make any sense out of. So we need things to happen more than once in order to understand them and in order to have some sort of regularity. So we have, uh, we're exploring repetition from lots of diverse angles as we always try to come at things from as many different angles as possible. And I think we should get started uh, with some chemistry and I will see you in about an hour and then we'll end with our Gamelon Ensemble which I think is going to be uh, quite a unique experience for all of us. Okay. Um, thanks Dan for curating this series, putting together what looks like a really interesting program related to this idea of repetition. So Dan called me up at some point and he said, repetition, can you say something about repetition? I'm thinking about a theme that relates to, can you repeat that? And I started thinking about repetition and in my own science and I guess what I'm going to tell you about is, say what? Nanoscale repetition in post-it notes and shoe soles. That seemed like really disparate items. They seem really unusual, and so the question is, how are these things all related? So I want to start off by thinking about plastics, and I want to ask the audience, when you guys think of plastic, what do you think of? Someone shout out some plastics. Polymer. Polymers. Yeah, okay. Try me on some concrete polymers. What kind of polymers do you think of? Sorry? Poly. Polyethylene, okay, polyethylene is definitely a, a nice polymer. I'll say something about that. If you were living in the 1970s and you were thinking about polymers, sorry, Tupperware. Yeah, we'll talk about Tupperware in a second. Polyester, right? That's my favorite, right? So polyester, uh, some of you will recognize where that came from, right? Polyester is a polymer. I heard some people mention polystyrene, right? Polystyrene is an interesting polymer that's used in all sorts of materials ranging from uh, from drink cups to packing peanuts, right? Polyethylene was mentioned, right? Polyethylene shows up in a couple of different flavors, right? In the context of things like food packaging wraps, something like this, I hope no one in this audience has, but that's a hip replacement, right? So polyethylene actually appears in a number of other materials too, things like bulletproof vests and combat helmets for soldiers out in the field, right? Polypropylene Tupperwares, right? Polypropylene Tupperwares, polypropylene long underwear, some of you might have for a, a dark, cold day like today in Wisconsin, right? And of course, polycarbonate. Polycarbonate, some of you know as that evil plastic that leaches that thing called bisphenol A that's been in the, in the news a lot lately, right? Polycarbonate's another material that you know well because it's the material that's used in compact discs. And for those of you who have plexiglass somewhere in your house, plexiglass is also polycarbonate. Okay, so these things are polymers, right? Polymers are produced on huge scales. And I just want to say a little bit about, you know, what we actually do with them, right? So polystyrene is actually one of the oldest polymers that's known, oldest synthetic polymers known. It was discovered in Germany by an apothecary in about 1841. He was distilling the sap out of like a yew tree or something. And over the course of time, he let it sit there in the light and it turned into a white solid. And the yew tree sap that he distilled was called styrol. So in German, this is polystyrol. And it became polystyrene in common lexicon. Now, polystyrene was actually commercialized by a, a large chemical company in 1934 and was, was a critical material that was used in the German war effort. At this point, if you were to look at world production statistics for polystyrene, polystyrene is actually produced at about 50 mil million pounds per year, 
Um, actually, that's not right. That should be billion pounds per year, right? That's million tons, really. Okay, so it's produced at, at about 50 billion pounds per year. If you look at some of these other plastics that are up here, polypropylene was discovered in about 1950 by uh, Giulio Natta, who was an Italian scientist. Worldwide demand for polypropylene at this point is 180, sorry, billion pounds. Again, right? That's a preposterous number. I don't know what these numbers mean, okay? Um, if you go forward, you think about polyethylene. Polyethylene is, was discovered by Ziegler in 1952, and world demand for that, again, is 200 billion pounds, right? I don't know what these numbers mean, and, and they should be astonishing to you, right? Billions of pounds, right? But I want you to think about it in this context. These materials are cheap, and they constitute a very small amount of the oil that we extract from the ground. Commercial plastics constitute less than 10% of world oil production. Okay, so anytime you're thinking about this issue of plastics and should you recycle, should you reuse, what should you do, especially at the grocery store, the first question you should really ask yourself is how did you get to the grocery store? Because about 60% of the world's oil is actually burned for heat and transportation. Okay, so these numbers, those numbers I showed you for production statistics are actually not as large as the amount of oil that we pull out of the ground. The prices of these materials are reflected by the price of oil, of course. And so you see that polystyrene is one of the most extensive, and polyethylene, which is one of the most ubiquitous, is incredibly cheap. OK. Someone said something about polymers, which I'm going to call them polymers, because I don't like to pronounce that, that Y, like most people. Right? So polymers, right? So polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, polyester, polycarbonate. The word originates from the idea of polymer, right? Which can be broken in two parts from its Greek root. Poly meaning many and mers meaning parts. Now, if you go back one step and you think about not parts but one part, one part is called a monomer, right? So the idea in terms of polymers, you have all these little monomers, they're flying around in a little soup, and you do what's called a polymerization. So I'm gonna polymerize these monomers, and there are lots of ways for me to polymerize monomers. One way for me to polymerize them is into a linear chain, right? Stringing these things together like beads on a necklace. Right, so that's a linear polymer. I could polymerize them in other funny ways. And for example, I could make a chain that has little branches off of it, little short branches. That's a material that some of you know as linear low density polyethylene that's really common in a number of applications, like your toothbrush handle. You can polymerize these things into stars, right? Star polymers have these interesting compact structures. It turns out star polymers are really commonly used in, uh, in motor oils in your car, for example, okay? Because they have interesting viscosity properties, especially at very, very high temperatures. Finally, you can actually polymerize these into these kind of funny looking architectures, right? And these are referred to as bottle brush polymers. Bottle brushes because they look like a bottle brush at the molecular scale, right? You have these dense arms sticking off of a central backbone. Now you ask the question, how do you make a polymer, right? And I like this quote, at midnight, of a full moon, place your initiator and your monomer in a bucket labeled with the name of the polymer in runic letters. <laughs> Upon placing the bucket in a circle of lighted candles, recite aloud the polymerization incantation seven times and perform the polymer dance. Maybe Dan can demonstrate. Um, <laughs> if the polymerization is successful, a cold and violent wind will quickly arise and extinguish the candles and then die away as quickly as it arose. It's important that one fast for three days before and after carrying out the ceremony. <laughs> Following this little procedure usually does the trick. Right? The point is, the details here are a little bit complicated, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking to you about the details of polymerizations. This is something that, you know, I spend a, a whole semester teaching in a graduate level course, right? So that's not my aim here. The point is, it's not hard to do this, and it's, it's actually relatively easy to do on very, very large scales. Hence our access to lots of different synthetic polymers. OK. I want to say something about the sizes of polymers, right? Polymers come in lots of shapes and flavors, as we saw. But one of the questions is, how big are they? So if you think about monomers, the average monomer that you might consider, something like propylene, which is the precursor to polypropylene, has a size that's about 3 times 10 to the minus 10 
meters long. That would be three angstroms for those of you familiar with that unit. But to put that in a real scale, right? If you think about the average human hair and you think about the size of that monomer relative to the average human hair, this thing is one fi five hundred thousandth the width of a human hair. Right? These are incredibly tiny molecules. You take these things and you polymerize them and you can actually make their sizes much, much bigger. For example, you can make them up to about 10 nanometers or even 100 nanometers in size, right? And I'll tell you what a nanometer is here, right? A nanometer is, is a billionth of a meter, right? So these molecules still are relatively small, but they have these interesting macroscopic properties because when these molecules come together as an ensemble, kind of like individuals come together as a crowd, they manifest a nonlinear combination of the properties of all of the individuals. So it turns out when you make polymers, you don't have to be restricted to only one kind of monomer. You can polymerize lots of monomers together, and you can make something that's called a copolymer. Right? So I'm showing two different monomers, red and blue balls here, that can be polymerized into multiple different kinds of polymers. Right? Remember, I could also make all those beautiful different architectures, but let's just talk about linear polymers for a minute. I could enchain these things in random fashion. I could make something called a random copolymer. I could, if I controlled how I enchained them, right? I could select a red ball after a blue and a blue ball after a red, and I could make something that's an alternating copolymer. Alternatively, I could make something that's called a block copolymer, where all the reds react first, and then all the blues react later, right? The bottom line is every one of these polymer sequences for any pair of monomers that you might have defines a set of properties for that polymer, and ultimately those properties govern the application. Where will you use this material? I want to focus for a minute because I told you I'd tell you something about repetition, right? in shoe soles and post-it notes, I want to focus on these interesting materials called block copolymers. So what I'm showing you here is what I'm going to call an AB dye block polymer. So this is A monomer and B monomer, and I've, I've chained them together. Now to understand what's going on with a block copolymer and how it behaves, I'm going to appeal to an analogy that comes from a, a scientist named Eugene Helfand, who worked at at and Bell Labs back in the 1970s. And the analogy that he drew was the idea in, in a block copolymer is you're taking a cat and a dog who really dislike each other and tying them together by their tails. This cat and dog really don't like each other, so they're repelled from each other. These two polymers really don't like each other. They don't want to mix. They want to get away from each other. But at some point, the cat and the dog are going to run away from each other, and then they're going to get stuck because their tails are going to be yanking on each other, and they're not going to be happy about that, right? So you have to balance this repulsion between the cat and the dog and the pain in their tails, right, to get to some sort of equilibrium size. What happens in the polymer example, then, is, is that the chains hate each other and they try to get away from each other, but they don't want to stretch too far because stretching is bad for that polymer chain. So what you need to balance when you think about an AB dye block copolymer is this idea of interfacial tension, the tension between those two objects that hate each other so much, and stretching the chains. OK, so now I have this block copolymer. It's made some object here. This polymer chain is about 10 nanometers in, in length at this point because of these two segments that hate each other. And now I have to think about how this thing's going to pack. Yes, sir. Potential. Potentially. That sounds like a discussion for another time, though. I'm going to keep going. So um, what I want to think about is how these things are going to pack, right? They could pack to fill space in this way, right, so that the blue segments can hang out together and the red segments can hang out together, or my cats can be with the cats and the dogs can be with the dogs, right? But this is only one stripe, and you might ask, what happens at the end of this chain, right? Well, it turns out they can pack in three dimensions. And so a natural way for them to pack is so that red faces red, blue faces blue, dogs face dogs, cats face cats, and cats are surrounded by cats on all sides except for one. Well, this is repetition. Now this polymer, by virtue of the fact that I bonded these two segments together, is now self-organizing into this regular structure 
at the nanometer length scale. Why is that important? Well, it turns out when the polymer self-organizes in this particular way, it gives rise to a suite of new properties. Okay? And these are quite important materials. You use them every day. I'll say something about polymer composition very quickly. You can imagine that the cat and the dog don't need to be the same size, right? But they're still going to try to run away from each other. They're still trying to pack to fill space at some constant density, right? And so what happens then is that these polymer chains will pack in such a way that this interface is now curved. It's no longer flat. And so I'll make these sort of spheres or cylinders of my blue polymer in a matrix of the red polymer, right? And depending on the size of the blue block or the red block, I can make a variety of different morphologies. I can make a structure, for example, that has these cylinders of the blue polymer in a matrix of the red, or something that has spheres of the blue polymer in a matrix of the red. Now that's where the rubber literally hits the road, right? <laughs> Block of polymers are applied in a number of different applications, but one of them is in the context of your shoe soles, something that you thought you might understand that's, well, you wear your shoes quite a bit when you're wandering around, right? It turns out most shoe soles are made of what's known as an SBS rubber, or a polystyrene, polybutadiene, polystyrene tri-block copolymer. You see, the idea in a shoe sole is actually that you have a material that makes this morphology with these cylinders of polystyrene in a matrix of polybutadiene. Why is that interesting? Well, that's interesting because the polystyrene is stiff and glassy, right? So it's kind of like having little rocks that are covalently bonded then to this matrix of rubber, right? So you get the tackiness and the, and the spring of, of your shoe sole out of that rubbery segment, and you get the mechanical integrity, the fact that your shoe sole doesn't just go sliding off your shoe from the styrene, because polybutadiene, if you just tried to use it by itself, would literally not stick to anything. Another application where you see block copolymers that you may or may not have realized is actually a block copolymer is in the context of post-it notes, right? So 3M Corporation in our neighboring state, which we'd like to be rivals with, um, just across the border actually makes post-it notes, and most of their products are based on what are called pressure-sensitive <laughs> adhesives, right? So that makes sense from the standpoint of a, a post-it note, right? You stick it to something, you unstick it, you stick it. It's pressure-sensitive, right? And if you think about a pressure-sensitive adhesive, it turns out the adhesive material is actually a polystyrene block, polyenbutyl acrylate, dye block copolymer that makes the spheres-type morphology. And it turns out the polystyrene, again, gives you the mechanical integrity because it's stiff and glassy. And it's the polyenbutyl acrylate that's tacky. That's what allows this thing to stick to whatever you're trying to fix it to. So with that, I just want to conclude and say, look, repetition at the nanoscale gets you pretty far. It gets you from monomers to polymers made of many, many little parts. Polymers, of course, depending on how you make them, can be made into copolymers random copolymers, alternating copolymers, and of course block copolymers, which ultimately self-organize at that nanometer length scale to give you useful materials. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm going to hand off the microphone to the next speaker. much. One moment while I pull up my slide here. Excellent. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm not as dynamic as Mahesh, so I'm going to actually stand in one place. Uh, my name is Audrey Gash. I, can everybody hear me OK? I'm an associate professor in the genetics department here on campus. And uh, tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about repetition and cycles in cellular behaviors. Now, uh, what I'm not going to tell you about is what's on my first slide here. Mahesh just gave a beautiful talk about polymers in, uh, in structures and chemistry. 
And uh, of course, much of living cells involves repetition at the structural level. And what I have shown here are two different uh, structures in biology. The top one is a, a, a polymer of actin cables that helps to make up your, your muscle fibers. This, of course, is a polymer, very well-known polymer of DNA. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. What I want to talk about is a different type of repetition that's very important in living creatures, and that is repetition in behaviors or processes. There are many different examples of cycles that happen in living cells. Uh, I'm going to tell you in detail about one tonight. And it's maybe not so surprising that living creatures have cycles of, of uh, physiology because many features in nature, the environments in which living creatures live, are also cyclical. So uh, it's, uh, we can think about the day-night cycle, which is a very predictive cycle, happens every 24 hours. The lunar cycle happens about once a month. And of course, we have the cycling of the seasons that are fairly predictive, predictable. Um, and so, uh, in many cases, we can think about these cycles in nature and begin to think about how cells uh, have evolved to live with those cycles. So for example, many of us have heard about circadian rhythms that are actually hardwired programs in our cells that allow uh, creatures to live uh, in, a, a long, in a productive way with the day and night cycles, for example. example. So we, uh, we humans sleep at night, we're awake during the day, we have these different cycles. It turns out if people live for some amount of time in dark, our bodies still actually cycle with about a 24 hour period. Um, there are other types of, of cycles. One that happens in plants, I'll just mention very briefly, is called vernalization. Plants have to know when to flower at the right time. If they flower too early and a, and a cold snap comes, they're in big trouble in nature. And so cells have mechanisms of um, sensing cyclical patterns, such as winter. Um, I'm not going to talk about that so much uh, tonight. But what I want to do want to uh, do is give one detailed example of a very important type of cycle or repetition, which is the cell division cycle, or cell cycle, we call it for short. Uh, now, my research is in budding yeast, and so that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. Probably everybody here has had experience with budding yeast. It's the, the type of microbes that's, uh, that's used to make bread, used to make beer, used to make wine. It also turns out that budding yeast is a very important biological model for what's known as basic science or discovery-based science, which really means scientists are trying to study these creatures to understand how life works. And through that type of basic uh, science or discovery-based research, we scientists collectively have understood this growth cycle. So um, you'll see in a moment why we call yeast budding yeast. So we start here with a tiny little cell, cartoon of a cell with a purple nucleus. And when times are good and cells have lots of food and, and nutrients, they will initiate a program, this program called the cell cycle. In yeast, cells go, uh, go through an imaginary point called start. They commit to going through this cell cycle, and they initiate a bunch of processes. Now, these cells bud when they divide, which means they make a little, they, they, they kind of bulb off a little bit of their surface, and they start filling it with stuff that the cells need. Now, in order to fill that emerging bud that's going to turn into a new cell, the existing cell has to make a lot of things. First of all, all cells need a DNA blueprint, and so the existing cell first has to prepare to divide by replicating its DNA. This is going to give a, a, um, a, a, a genome to the new cell. The existing cell has to make a lot of protein, has to make a lot of structures, has to make a lot of things. And so as the cells go through this cycle, this little bud gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The cell then goes through um, an ordered program of events changing its structure, then just before the cells divide, the chromosomes line up, then get pulled to the opposite parts of the cell, and voila, in the end, we have two cells where we started with one. And then the process begins again. 
And so this is a very, uh, by now, after probably a century of study, fairly well understood repetitive cycle that happens in all living creatures. Although the details are a little different, all cells go through this type of program. And then we have these different phases that scientists refer to. S phase is the phase during which DNA is being replicated, for example. So I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that this cycle is what we call hardwired. It is a program in the cell. How does that work? This is in contrast to responses, environmental responses. So if we think about the day-night cycle um, and how creatures respond to that day-night cycle, some of how we respond is truly a response to sensing light or sensing temperature. The cell cycle, in this case, um, is really a hardwired program that's encoded in the genome. So I want to tell you in, in, in just a few uh, short minutes an overview of how these hardwired rep repetitive uh, programs work. So many of you are probably familiar with DNA, the genome of an organism. And um, you may know that the DNA encodes all the information that the cell needs or the organism needs to live. So DNA is like the DVD that you put into your computer. On its own, the DVD cannot do anything. You need a reader. The reader turns out to be the cell. So cells have machinery that can take this DNA blueprint and um, read it and then use that information to carry out functions and processes. And so ma many of you may know that we start with the DNA blueprint, and I should point out this is a very repetitive uh, biopolymer of chemical molecules. The DNA is read by the cellular machinery in, and transcribed into a related language called RNA or messenger RNA. And then this chemical language is translated to a different language, and that is the language of proteins. Um, for the most part, it's actually the proteins that are doing the functions in the cell. The proteins are the little, little machinery. We have different types of proteins to do different jobs in the cell. And so this is how we go from encoded information into cellular machinery. One thing that's very important that a lot of people don't think about, I think many people have heard of genes and have heard of the genome. A gene is a segment of the DNA that has the information to make one of these little machines, a little protein. But it turns out that for most of us sitting in this room at this moment, most of the genes in our cells are not going through this process. They're what we call off or silenced, okay? Uh, uh, many genes in our cells are reserved for particular situations or certain circumstances. And they're only made into proteins under those cases. How does the cell know when to do that? Well, there are little controllers or switches. And those controllers and switches are actually different types of proteins, okay? So what I'm drawing here is the purple protein is actually binding to this DNA. We call this type of controller a transcription factor. And so it is the little switch that turns on this particular gene causes the cell to say, oh, we need to now make stuff from this gene. It transcribes the RNA and makes the protein. And the protein goes on then to do some function. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, I, what I want to uh, capture in the next slide is how we can take the information that's encoded here in this DNA and hard program a cycle such as the cell cycle. So if we come back to our little cycle here, um, we can start with our, our individual cell on the cartoon diagram here. And remember I said that cells actually sense their environment. They make sure that times are good. There's enough nutrients to go. They all decide to initiate this cell cycle. And so what do they do? Well, these cells are approaching the phase when they're gonna have to replicate all of their DNA, okay? So what they do is, in the cyc cell cycle phase that precedes that, they actually turn on the genes that then make the messenger RNA that encodes the information to make the proteins that are responsible for replicating DNA. And so there is a delay, a temporal delay, between um, reading this DNA, transcribing to this language, translating to the language of proteins, okay? And for this reason, the switches, the control switches I told you about, are actually activated in the preceding phase uh, compared to when those proteins are needed. Now remember, I told you these, some proteins, transcription factors, are the little controllers. They actually are the switches. 
that control the process. So there are many proteins uh, that may be um, turned on or made during this S phase when DNA replication is happening. Some of them are the controllers. So they are going to then go do their function, which is to bind the DNA that encodes the proteins that are important for the next phase. Okay, here the cells are making a spindle, so they're preparing to line up their chromosomes, for example. And so when that transcription factor or controller is active, it causes the cell to make the RNA, which makes the protein, which does the function. Some of these proteins then turn on the next uh, uh, cycle and so on. And so what is the beautiful thing about um, these type of hardwired programs is that they emerge. Now, I should point out this is very oversimplified, okay? What I hope you can see is that the cells are going through a cycle. You can see this morphological uh, change in the cartoon here. But there's also a cycle of, really, chemistry, biochemistry, that um, is giving rise to this cycle. And what I'm not showing you is that it turns out there are many cycles of cycles that are all overlaid with one another to make this program happen. And that are these cycles of cycles of other molecules and switches, there are many, many different types of switches. And they're all fluctuating and going up and, up and down at the appropriate time. And so it really is an amazing feat of nature uh, to, to come up with such a cycle that seems so simple. Even when if we look at real cells under the microscope, it seems so simple that they're going through this division cycle. And underneath it all, it's incredibly complex. Now, what's um, I think just as beautiful as thinking about what gives rise to this hardwired program is thinking about when cells don't want to do these programs or cycles. And it turns out that this is not a, uh, one of the fundamental uh, features of living creatures is that they respond to stimuli. And so cells, there are, there are situations when cells don't want to be dividing. If there are not enough nutrients, we're talking about yeast, they don't want to make more of themselves. They want to stop and wait until times get better. If, for example, there is a major problem with the DNA, so for example, when cells are exposed to certain types of drugs, they get mutations that damages the DNA and changes the information that's encoded in that DVD blueprint. When the cell has surveillance mechanisms, so when the cell senses that something's wrong with the DNA, they need to stop the cycle. They don't want to propagate those errors in progeny. And so cells have what are called checkpoints where they arrest, okay? And, so, and they wait and stop, fix the problem, and when times get better, they will reinitiate the cycle. And so does anybody have an idea of what happens in cells if they lose that checkpoint, or the ability to sense when they really should not be dividing? Yes, somebody can shout it out. That's exactly right. So cancers are caused, many, many, many different types of cancers are caused when cells lose their ability to sense when they should not be growing. Uh, and so I think that this is really um, equally amazing. I study environmental responses, so I'm a little bit biased. Um, but it's, so it's important to think, although there's repetition in cycles all around us in, in the physical world and in the living world, it's important to think about when it's important not to be repetitive. And with that, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to thank you all. I'm going to turn the, the podium over to the next speaker. Thank you. Marcus Brower. I'm faculty in the Department of Psychology here at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about repetition in human cognition and thought. 
And one of the things that we psychologists really like to do is do little studies, do little experiments. So I'm going to start out with a little experiment right here. Um, I want to ask you, I'm going to show you Chinese ideographs. And all I want to ask you at this point is to look at these Chinese ideographs. That's all I'm asking you at this point. So please go ahead, enjoy what I'm going to show you. Is there one of these two Chinese ideographs that you prefer over the other? You find it more beautiful, you find it aesthetically more appealing. So I would like to ask you to make up your mind and then I'm going to ask for a show of hands. So is there one of these two that you think is more beautiful? So why don't we start out with the one on the left in order to be sure which one is left. Put it on the left. So <laughs> show of hands, who uh, prefers the one on the left? Okay, this is about, oh wow, this is about... Mm. 20, 30 people, okay, and then ha, what is, um, who are the ones who prefer the one on the right? Okay, I don't know if you've turned around. I would say that uh, there are more people who prefer the one on the right. As the difference is not as big as I'd hoped for, but um, <laughs> they're about, I would say it was about 40 to 30. Well, what happened here? Um, um, you did behave as most participants in these types of studies uh, behave. W the participants prefer the one that they have seen more often. And it actually turns out that you've seen the one on the right five times, and you've seen the one on the, le on, on the left only once. And it turns out that the more often we are exposed to a certain stimulus, the more we tend to like that stimulus. So that phenomenon is sometimes called uh, repeated exposure or mere exposure. And we know that a repeated exposure to a stimulus leads to increased likings. And this has been shown in many randomized experiments, highly controlled experiments. You can imagine that for half of the participants, it's one ideograph that's shown five times, the other time one time, and then for the other half of the participants, it's of course a uh, counterbalance. So I'm not going to bore you with these controlled laboratory studies. I thought I'd, it would be more fun to talk about the, the field studies that have been done in this domain. There's one study, um, um, sorry, the, uh, oh, was done a while ago. And what these researchers did, they purchased uh, um, space in um, student newspapers to put in advertisement. And what they put in these advertisements were simply a Turkish word. And what they wear, what they varied is the frequency with which these Turkish word appeared in the student newspaper. And then um, at the end of the semester, they distributed questionnaires to a large number of students on campus and asked, well, how much um, make good battery? Do you think this has a, this word, which you obviously don't know, has a positive meaning or a bad meaning? Do, do you do like how it sounds, how it reads, or do you not like it? And um, not surprisingly, con confirming the hypothesis, the more often students, the more often the word appeared in the student newspaper, the more uh, participants liked it. Another study, uh, a little more recent, has to do in this study, the researchers asked um, um, eight female research confederates to take a seat in large college classrooms. They asked them to sit down and not interact with anybody, not with a professor, not with any of these other students. They simply sat down in the first uh, row of seats and so where everybody could see them. And um, what they varied is how often each of these women came to class. One of them never came. One of them came five times. Actually, no, two of them never came. Two of them came five times. Two of them came 10 times, and two of them came 15 times. And at the end of the semester, uh, the researchers showed the students pictures of these eight women and asked them to evaluate how, how, how attractive do you find the personality of these women, each of which you see on the picture, and then um, it turns out that the more often uh, each woman participated in the class activities was there sitting on the first row, the more participants liked it. It's a very clear linear trend. If you saw the graph, it's, it's every bar is, is, is consistently higher than the previous uh, bar. So um, what it shows is the more often we are exposed to something, whether it be people, advertisement, <laughs> commercial products, uh, um, or any other type of attitude object, the more we tend to like that attitude object. And there's, of course, a whole 
bunch of studies trying to understand why that is the case, but I'm not going to go into detail. Um, I'm going to move on to another study, and for this study I need a little victim, uh, actually um, I need a musician, and then here I know that Dan is a musician, so I'm going to ask Dan um, for his opinion. Actually, Dan, you can, can stay where you are. Um, I, I want to ask you, um, what's, uh, you're a musician, what do you think about Beyonce? I mean, not her music, her songs, and how she sings, and um, what do you think about her? I don't have much of an opinion, but I'm not a big fan. Okay. Um, I, actually, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if the people in the back heard that. Could you repeat that? I'm not really a big fan of Beyonce. Okay. okay. And now I, I'm, I'm going to ask Dan one more time to say what he, and I want you to pay attention very closely to the wording of how he expresses his attitude. Dan, can you say one more time? I am not a big fan of Beyonce. Okay. <laughs> it turns out um, we don't care at all about the wording of uh, Dan's uh, opinion. What we do care about, about the fact is that he just said it three times what he thought about Beyonce. And there are studies that have shown that repeated expression of one's attitude leads to what we call attitude polarization. It leads to more extreme attitudes. Things we like, once we express our attitude repeatedly, we tend to like them even more. Things we dislike, once we express our attitude repeatedly, we tend to like them even less. Once again, there are many controlled experiments. X actually was my research area when, when I was a graduate student. Um, but uh, I'm not going to talk to you about those. I'm going to talk to you about a more realistic setting where this repeated attitude expression occurs. And we refer to that as the group polarization phenomenon. It's something you may have observed yourself when you put four people together in the same room. And, and, and there are four people who are already on one side of the issue. So um, they all share the fact that they're relatively pro or relatively contra the issue, and then you ask them to engage in a group discussion on this topic, what you will find that after the group discussion, the position of the average group member has shifted towards the extreme point. They are now, the average group member is now even closer to the either pro end or the counter end um, than before the group discussion. We refer to that as the group polarization phenomenon, and once again, a number of people have studied that. There are several explanations. One is the fact that during this discussion we're exposed to new arguments that are pro and therefore we shift our attitudes. Another one is normative influence. Um, we hear all these other people who express their pro attitude, so I want to keep up with them. Oh, this is obviously pro group, so I better keep up with them. And then I also shift my own attitude. But it turns out that repeated attitude expression is one of the phenomena that explains that, uh, that contributes to that group polarization phenomenon. The simple fact that during the group discussion, people repeatedly state their point of view causes them to adopt more extreme viewpoints and to even have stronger opinion about the issue before the group discussion than after. And one little twist, it, it turns out that if during the group discussion, okay, repeated attitude expression leads to more polarization. But if during the group discussion, other group members repeat what I say and therefore socially validate my repeated attitude expression, oh, what Bill said before, I want to I uh, talk about this even more. Under these conditions, repeated attitude expression really leads to uh, more pronounced attitudes and more extreme evaluations. And you published that a while ago. Okay, so now I can actually tell you what the three topics are. I'm gonna, I talked to you about repeated exposure. I just mentioned repeated expression of opinions and now I wanna completely switch, go to repetition in learning. Um, um, imagine you have, your task is to read a textbook um, at the university and you have studied that textbook, you've read it. What do you think is more effective? then that you spend the next 30 minutes rereading that textbook trying to learn what's in the chapter? Or do you, if you spend the next 30 minutes um, <coughs> repeatedly testing yourself on what you have just learned? Well, this is a symposium on repetition, so you can guess what the <laughs> answer is. <laughs> I know. It turns out that uh, recent studies have shown that it is much more effective to uh, then spend the subsequent time on repeated testing of the material rather than on continuing to learn the material um, to be memorized. But that repeated testing only works 
if um, the learner gets immediate feedback about whether his or her answer is correct or incorrect. And um, this is a number of researchers, uh, they're actually my colleagues here at the University of Wisconsin who um, used that technique, used test-enhanced learning in, in, in the university courses. And the way that this test-enhanced learning works is after each class, com uh, students complete multiple choice quizzes on the internet at, at home. And each multiple choice quiz con consists of three or four uh, questions. Um, they receive for each answer immediate feedback about their answer, whether it is correct or not, and what the correct answer is and why. And then for each of these subtests, which consists of three or four uh, questions, they can move on to the next subtest only if they get 100% right. And then once they get 100% right, they do the next subtest, then they do about three or four of these subtests after each class. And if they do that every week, then they get a grade for that, they get points for that, and that grade counts for about 10% of the total grade. That method is sometimes called low impact testing. Low impact testing. Why is it called like that? It, it has, of course, students can cheat if they want. They can have the textbook open right next to them while they answer the question. But that that would not be a smart thing to do. But they could cheat in theory, and the the, the teachers are aware of that. And therefore, it, it's only 10% of the grade. So this is called low impact testing. Well, studies have shown empirical studies where control groups were compared to experimental group that that teaching method is actually extremely effective and uh, significantly increases uh, student learning. So repetition in learning is very important, as you can imagine. And actually, just as an anecdote, as you probably know, uh, what is most effective if this repetition occurs at increasing time intervals, you have an information, you test yourself after two days, then you test yourself after four days, then you test yourself after a week, then you test yourself after four weeks, and finally after six months. And if the six months, you can still reproduce that piece of information, it has been transferred to long-term memory, and you will probably never forget it in your life. Thank you very much. Okay, well, try again. Um, all right, so I'm um, glad you can all hear me now. Um, uh, I will introduce myself very shortly. Um, I thought we'd just start with a quick video to start off with, so uh, I'll, I'll hold introductions just for a little while. Um, so let's just get back to the start of this one. And <laughs> A vai sa va se reneta pita e moise te se reneto vi giuco su svati od koje kraji ne ova chi è usa ed angoti na nie su to la zilia mosa anchi u te sesto crilovi già Okay, I, I think we'll we'll, um, we'll we'll stop that one there. Um, now, obviously, um, there we, we we had an example um, of uh, musical repetition that I'd like to uh, get to um, in a second. You, you heard the repeated line, <laughs> like that. This the the the, the, the uh, tune that you were singing over and over again. Um, so so come to that in one sec. Um, but. Uh, what we are going to focus on uh, for the whole uh, talk um, is uh, the issue of repetition in Homer, um, because uh, my name is Will Brockless, I'm from the Classic
mathematics departments um, over at UW. Um, uh, you, you'll notice that unlike the rest of the presenters, I've actually got some notes. Uh, in, in, uh, in the humanities, if you don't come with the text, then you have no authority. Whereas in, in the sciences, if you come with the text, then you obviously don't know what you're talking about. So um, <laughs> if, 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 you just, um, if you just indulge me there, I mean, it's, it's, it's a sort of cultural difference there. Um, so, 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 so as I said, we, we, we were just looking at a bit of, a bit of uh, musical repetition. Now, if we were listening to Homer, if we were lucky enough to uh, get, get in, um, uh, well, uh, what, what I like to call a time ream rather than a tri ream, so a time ream, and, and, and we get back and, and we could actually witness Homer performing, then it, we, we would get it, uh, get, in, get in a musical experience, probably quite like what we got, just got from uh, that guy, Avdor um who, who was singing um, in, uh, I think, the, the area of modern Bosnia in, in, in the early 20th century in, in that particular video. Um, so, so repeated musical lines, that is one thing that I'm afraid we have lost from Homer. We, we don't know the exact music that they would have been singing when they were performing these things. Um, but we do know a whole lot of other things uh, about repetition in Homer, uh, which I, I'm hoping to uh, reveal to you now. Um, the, the, the reason that I actually brought in um, Avdor Medvedevich is, is he is actually a very famous um, guy in Homeric scholarship um, because there were two guys uh, by the surnames Parry and Lord uh, who went uh, to what was then Yugoslavia, um, I think it was the 20s um, it going into the 30s, um, to basically find parallels for how they thought that Homeric poetry, uh, these famous poems, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, how they were composed and performed. And they thought they would find these in oral story storytelling traditions. Um, and, and they thought they found an excellent parallel in guys like Ad Avdor Medvedevich, who uh, put together their verse uh, using similar uh, re repetitive phrases and structures as they saw uh, in the Homeric poems. Um, so uh, if, if we could actually understand uh, Serbian, I don't know if there's anybody here who, who can, but, but um, if, if, if you could understand Serbian, th then, you would, th then you would hear some other repetition um, in Avdo's performance, which, which would be informative for Homer. Um, he, he was not only singing re repeated musical lines, he was also re uh, singing repeated lines of, of five stresses per line. And he was also singing repeated phrases. He was using these repeated uh, phrases, repeated formulae, to put together his lines. Because uh, he was actually composing in the moment of performance. He hadn't memorised that. He was putting to the verse together as he was singing, which is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but we get very similar phenomena in the, in the Homeric poems. Um, so for Parry and Lord, this was their argument about Homer, that basically um, Homer was an oral poet like Avdor Medvedevich, that he was using uh, repeated uh, structures in order to put uh, these poems together in the moment of performance um, and, and for them Homer was a poet who'd been uh, brought up in this oral tradition and was performing in this oral tradition. Um, so to move on uh, I, I would just like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what goes on in the individual line in Homer. Um, so, so I mentioned that in, in the uh, poetry that Avdor Medvedevich was putting together, it's five stresses per line, it's a regular metre. Um, similarly, you get a regular metre for, for Homer. Here, um, it's what's called six feet, six groups of either long or, or, or short syllables. Um, you can see I've sort of divided it up um, going across um, the slide here. Um, it's, so it's not exactly like um, English verse or indeed like uh, the, the, um, the Serbian verse that, that Avdo was singing um, because uh, it's divided up according to long or short syllables. A long syllable is a, is, a, is a syllable with a long vowel or a diphthong in it or that ends with two consonants. Um, to get a rough idea of this, um, of the repeated structures that they're using in this verse, um, here's an English example that roughly approximates to it. But anyway, uh, down in a deep, dark depth 
Shell sat an old cow munching a beanstalk. Um, and they, they, they get that sort of alternation of long and short. That's, that's the sort of thing that they have. And, and you have these choices that you can make. You can either use a dactyl, which are the things at the top with, with the long, short, short. Dact dactyl um, is so called after your finger. That's Greek for a finger. And that's long, short, short. Th think, think of a pterodactyl. That's, that, that's a wing finger. Um, and uh, the, the, these are spondies underneath, which, which are two, two longs. That's the sequence there. Um, to give an example in Greek, um, actually from Homer, um, he, here's, here's a full line that, uh, that comes up a few times, especially in the Odyssey. Um, so, ton dapame bomanos prosepe polymetes odysseus. Um, you, you can hear the really nice sort of rhythm to it. Um, and um, Oh, I've actually missed out an S from, from Odysseus, sorry, oops. But anyway, um, it, roughly that means um, uh, answering him or her Odysseus of many whiles said. Um, I've, I've put it in its Greek word, although that's why it looks weird. Um, but uh, that's, that, that's, that's a full line uh, from Homer. Um, now, um, what we've actually got here, um, if you divide the line up, is two separate formulae, two separate repeated phrases that come back again and again and again in Homeric poetry. Um, in the second half of the line, well, roughly the second half of the line, it doesn't split into two perfect halves. They, they never do, because, um, otherwise it would be two separate lines. But um, in, the in, in roughly the second half of the line, we've got polymetis or dusseus, so Odysseus of many wiles. That is a phrase, a, a repeated formula that comes back again and again and again in Homeric poetry. And even more than that, it comes back at exactly that place in the line. Uh, nowhere else. It only comes at that pace of the line, and it only comes when Odysseus is in that grammatical function, when he is in the subject case, when he is doing an action. It never comes otherwise. So, so, so it's, um, it, it's, it's a very special phrase for that place in the line. Similarly, um, oh, incidentally, that, occur, that occurs, I think, it's 88 times in, in, uh, in, in exactly that place in the line in, in Homeric poetry. So it's a lot of repetition there. Um, the, in the first half of the line, tonda per me vobnos plus a pair, um, with, with the um, variant for, for her, ten. Um, that um, is a repeating phrase um, to do with answering somebody that, again, only occurs in that position, only occurs at the start of a line, in that very position, um, and that uh, occurs um, over a hundred times in, in, in the Homeric poems. So um, a, a lot of repetition of that phrase. Um, so uh, that means um, that, that basically the poet can put together lots of different um, phrases, like we were using lots of different, um, uh, what was it, monomers, that's what they're called, aren't they? Yeah, lots of different monomers to, 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 to create our polymers. Uh, you, you can take these apart and create lots of different lines um, out of them um, in a similar way. Um, moving on, um, we also get repetition in Homeric poetry beyond individual lines. Um, so, so far we've, we, we've looked at a single line um, and, and, we've, and we've looked at the little chunks that made that up. Um, Parry and Lord thought those were the ways that, that the Homeric poets and also guys like Avdor Medvedevich went about putting together lines in performance. That it was very difficult. They had these very regular meters that they had to create lines out of. It was really useful if they had these chunks that they could uh, stick together um, to, to, to make their lines. Um, but yeah, we can go up above the level of the individual line. Um, one thing that's very noticeable um, in, in Homer, particularly in the Iliad, when you first come to it, is these repeated messenger speeches. So somebody will say to somebody else, um, could you go to this other person and deliver this message to them? And then that person will go over um, and speak to that person and deliver exactly word for word what they've just heard from the other person. Uh, which, which for us sounds a bit over the top, but that's, that, that, that's, that's what you get in Homeric poetry. Um, so it's a very precise repetition for messengers speeches. Um, also, uh, beyond word-for-word uh, -word repetition, it's not always word-for-word -word repetition, you get repeated structures of scenes. Um, so particular types of scene, uh, you will have exactly the same order of events every time um, it comes up. So 
So for instance, when a Homeric hero arms for battle, um, there's a very precise sequence of which order he puts each bit of armour on. I um, think it's sort of starting from bottom up, so far as I recall, off the top of my head. But anyway, um, that's, um, yeah, that, the, the very precise sequence that, that occur, uh, uh, recurs um, that the bard could access in his mind and think, oh yeah, right, I'm going into an arming scene, I'll, I'll put it in that order, that's the order I've learned. Um, also, when you get up to the level of whole stories, there are these uh, re repeated structures to those that would help the bards to put together those stories. Um, so, uh, for instance, the return story, um, which we find um, in a lesser known Homeric epic called the Nostoi, um, or the Returns, and also in the entire Odyssey. That, that structure uh, helped the poet to put together the entire epic, um, that, that repeated structure that had been passed down in this oral tradition. So, um, then the challenge comes that it's okay, so, so Parry and Lord have very persuasively um, come up with an explanation for, um, for these repetitions in Homer. They've said these are tools that the poet uses in the moment of performance to put together verse because it's very difficult to just um, improvise verse um, in, in this way. Um, so that was very persuasive and, and, and most people think yes um, Homer um, did arise from an oral tradition. Um, but then the challenge came of how we were going to interpret this, th th this repetition, how, we, how this was going to feed into our understanding of the Homeric poems as works of art. Um, so uh, now uh, there, there are such things as uh, hardline parryists today. Um, rather unsurprisingly, Parry himself was, was a hardline parryist. Um, and um, here's, here's what he had to say, uh, roughly. I mean, this is sort of paraphrasing him, I'm afraid. This isn't actually what he said exactly. Um, but um, th this is the sort of thing that he, he says about these repetitions. Um, so in his opinion, when Homer sang th this phrase that we came across, Odysseus of the many wilds, Polymetes Odysseus, he just meant Odysseus. That's all he meant by it. Um, so in his poetic tradition, in his performance tradition, there was no other way of saying Odysseus at that part of the line in the subject case. So he just had to. He just had to include the of many wiles bit. That wasn't really meaningful. All he meant to say was Odysseus. So um, that, that really so, so, sort of gives us um, a rather sort of reduced view um, of Homeric poetry and, and really these are quite prosaic uh, concepts that are being conveyed as well. If it's just basically that line we looked at, it, he, he, Parry would say that just means Odysseus answered. It doesn't mean any more than that. So you, you really sort of pared down from what you had originally. Um, now a lot of people, uh, su such as my interlocutor off the screen here, um, would uh, re reply to Parry in this that, that, that this, this does not seem a, a totally satisfactory way of, of reading Homer, really. Um, so they, they might, for instance, say, but Milman, um, by uh, saying that sort of thing, you're really missing a lot of the beauty and the grandeur um, of Homeric formulae. I mean, some of them are really quite simple, like the answering formulae, um, but some others of them um, carry a lot of the most memorable phrases um, for us um, as modern readers, um, so, so at least for us. Um, so, uh, and we, we, we have phrases such as Odysseus of the many wiles, which of course characterises Odysseus, swift-footed Achilles, Hector, tamer of horses, far-shooting Apollo, cloud-gathering Zeus, Aphrodite, lover of laughter, and the wine-dark sea, a very famous one. And, and these, these are things that people really remember from Homer because of that repetition and also because of the beauty of, of, of these poetic phrases. And it, it seems to a lot, of, a lot of scholars, me included, that it would be very unlikely that ancient audiences who would use either those very words or the individual bits that go to make up those very words in their everyday speech, that they would find those epithets, such as the wine dark, or the wine dark bit of it, the, the adjective wine dark, that they would find that meaningless when they heard the wine dark sea um, in Homer, that they would just think, oh yeah, he's just saying that to fill in the line, he just meant sea. Um, so uh, that, that would be a first thing that, that the people would, would take issue with, with uh, Parry over. Um, a second 
uh, response might be um, the, the, the purple respondent here um, who, 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 who's come up with another objection. So, but Millman, uh, when we look at repetitive structures beyond the individual line, um, we see that Homer uh, sometimes makes very significant changes and uh, a lot of people have pointed to, 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 to this sort of thing um, to uh, uh, point up uh, how repetition isn't the only thing that's going on. Um, just for instance, with messenger speeches, yes, it is the, it is the case um, that, the, that the majority of times uh, the message will be conveyed exactly but sometimes it's not. Sometimes there are very subtle variations. And um, you, you might well expect an audience who were very well versed in these sort of uh, traditions, who knew about these repetitions and all that sort of thing, were very attuned to it, to notice these uh, variations and think, oh, why has the poet done that? Uh, so just to give one li little example of that, in book, uh, in book nine, Agamemnon, the great king, he sends Odysseus on an embassy to placate Achilles, who's sulking in his tent. And, and Odysseus, uh, rather cunningly, opts to um, convey all of Agamemnon's lovely offers of gifts, but to miss out Agamemnon's little sign-off right at the end, uh, when, when Agamemnon says, oh, I'll, I'll tell him this when you're finishing, and let him yield to me, insofar as I'm kinglier, and I boast that I'm older by birth. And Odysseus obviously thought that wasn't very wise to put in because Achilles is kind of irascible and uh, yeah, you, 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 you don't want to get on this bad side. So um, th th this, this is really part of the characterization of Odysseus, that he was clever enough to leave that out. Another significant variation, um, well, I've mentioned arming scenes, uh, which are very uh, often exactly as you would expect them in the exact order you, you would expect. Um, however, you do get variations to that as well. Uh, for instance, in Iliad 18, you would normally expect a shield description to be um, uh, in w when the hero is putting the shield on. That's when the shield is described. But in Iliad 18, Achilles' shield is described as Hephaestus is making it. And so the poet is able to create this huge set piece uh, describing this shield and to describe it as a depiction of the entire Homeric world. It's a wonderful uh, po uh, piece of poetry at the end of um, Iliad 18, and, and that was varying uh, his traditional structure. My third and final response to uh, Parry um, comes from uh, the uh, green, green corner over here. Um, so um, you could quite uh, reasonably object to Parry that uh, even by his own count, um, only about half of Homeric poetry is actually formulaic. Um, so the rest of it, um, the, 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 the poet would have considerable freedom um, to uh, create um, his, his own uh, stuff. So, um, and very often the, the, these are the most beautiful parts of the, of the poem. I mean, it's, it's the, 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 the parts that are really stuck with us in the Western tradition is, is, is some of the most beautiful uh, bits of poetry that we have. Um, uh, one of these, I think, um, occurs uh, in book 24. We're getting right to the end of the, of the Iliad. Um, and there's this um, rather amazing scene where, where, where Priam, the old king of Troy, um, he comes to the Greek camp um, and uh, Achilles has just killed Priam's son and Priam supplicates Achilles to try and get uh, the body of Hector, um, Priam's son, back from Achilles. Um, and we, we get this wonderful simile here which is unique in Homer. Um, this may have been invented by the poet for this particular moment uh, to, 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 to convey um, the uh, irony of the scene and also the reciprocity between these two characters. So here's where it says, he seized Achilles' knees with his hands and kissed the terrible man-slaying hands which killed his many sons. As when close folly seizes someone who kills a man in his fatherland and comes to another people, to the house of a rich man, and wonder holds the onlookers. Just so Achilles wondered when he saw godlike Priam. So, so in that simile, something amazing has happened that you've got a complete reversal of the roles of these 
um, two people, um, that uh, Achilles is the murderer of Priam's son. And yet Priam comes to Achilles' hut um, like someone who has committed a murder in his own country, who needs to gain forgiveness from somebody. And, and in this way, the poet, uh, by, by uh, bringing about that extreme reversal in this simile, establishes a reciprocity between these two figures. And, and you get this near impossible reconciliation between this, uh, the, the bloodiest of the Greeks and this patriarch of the Trojans. And shortly after this scene, they're joined together in mourning. Um, uh, uh, we've got Priam mourning for Hector and Achilles mourning for his old father, um, of whom Priam reminds him so much. Thank you. Well, we've covered a great deal of ground. Thank you so much, as always, to our really brilliant scientists and humanitarians. Um, it's always nice to welcome somebody from a new department into Soundwave. So this is our first experiment with classics. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to keep my remarks as brief as I possibly can. Those of you who know me know that that's quite difficult for me. Uh, but you can all see this display here, and I'm sure everyone is itching to hear the music that comes from it. I'll just mention briefly first that, as always, um, our panel of speakers will be around up front after we're done, and they're very happy to entertain conversations and questions from you, so come on up and meet everybody. Okay, so my confession to you is that I am a serial repeater. And what I mean by that, of course, is that I am a musician and therefore what I really do with my hours is I practice my instrument. In, the, in this case, it's the French horn, but it, we all practice, all of us musicians practice. So I want to begin by talking a little bit about how we use repetition to hone our, our craft and our art. And then I want to talk a little bit about repetition in music and how you might listen to repetition in music. So let's start by talking about practicing. It's very abstract. When my son was three, he began taking piano lessons, and his teacher said to him, well, you need to practice this. And I thought, my god, I'm 43, and I don't know how to practice. How is a three-year-old going to know how to practice anything? And uh, who studied an instrument? Lots of you. And who really understood how to practice? <laughs> yeah, one, one or two. It's not easy. So let's take a, let's sort of unpack this and let's take an example of something that we can learn how to do that's a little bit easier to understand. The example I want to take is darts. Because people can play darts in their basement or at a bar and darts is not that hard, although probably to win money at darts and get that good is very hard. But the game is easy to understand. You have a dartboard and you're some distance. I think it's six feet from the dartboard. And what are you trying to do? trying to get the dart in the board. So you throw the dart at the board. It's your first time you ever threw a dart and usually you miss the board. So you throw again and you throw again. Now every time you throw the dart you see where it goes and your body makes corrections. Blindfolded it would be very difficult to get good at darts. Same with pool, same with just about any kind of sport activity. We need to see the result of our action. So I'm not talking here about um, hiring a darts instructor, a tutor, taking lessons for 85 bucks an hour. I'm just talking about practicing by yourself, using your feeling of the throw and your perception with your eyes of the result of that throw. I think you'll probably agree with me that after about two days, you're hitting the board every time. After about five, this is talking about, we're spending serious time practicing these darts. We're spending two hours a day in the basement or, God help us, two hours a day at the bar, throwing darts. <laughs> so by the third day, we're starting to hit the bullseye. We're getting control. By the fifth day, we, we've gotten pretty good. We're actually hitting quite a few bullseyes. So let's step back and look at playing an instrument and see if we can come with some kind of comparison 
of what we're doing. So, first of all, I have to know what I'm trying to accomplish. This is the tricky part. Because I have in front of me a page of printed music. And that, while you might say that that page of printed music contains a lot of information, it also does not contain a lot of information. I want to come back to that. But for now, let's just say I'm trying to hit the notes that are given on the page. So I play and I listen. So in the place of my eyes, I have my ears. I listen, I hear what I got, and I hear what I missed. I can now go back and repeat and try to let my body correct. And sure enough, over time, I get more and more and more and more. My teacher says, good job. And I feel good about my playing. The problem is, as I stick with it, my teacher starts talking about style. And my teacher starts talking about affect, about emotion, about beauty. And I look at the printed page and there's nothing that says moderato. And it has the letter P. And I know that means piano, which means soft. And I know moderato means a tempo, a, a pace of the music that's not too fast and not too slow. But these are mere hints, mere hints of what I actually want to do with the music. And for a great example of where I need to go, think about how beautifully Will read the few quotes that he had in his presentation. I found it very moving. He read it with a lot of emotion. He put a lot into it. And it made those passages resonate for us a lot more, certainly for me a lot more, than when I read them when they first popped up on the screen. How did he know how to do that? Well, he studies the thing all the time. And there is this mysterious process by which he's able somehow to gain an understanding. So in the case of uh, me playing a piece of music, let me tell you some of the things that I have to think about. So it says P, and that means quiet. So I have to figure out how quiet, and why is it quiet? And what does every single note do that I play? If I am a pianist when I play a note, once I strike that note, the physics of the instrument takes care of the rest. But I'm not a pianist, I play the French horn, a brass instrument, I can make that note stay the same. I can make it grow. I can make it diminish like a piano does. I can put a little grow and then get smaller in it. How do I connect it to the next note? Do I want it to go da da? Or how about da da? Those are pretty similar, but they have a very different effect. How about da da? Or da da? I have lots of decisions that I have to make. And this is where we start getting into the art of playing an instrument, of playing music. Because what I basically need to do is I need to make a map in my head. It's my dartboard for this particular piece of music. And this map tells me exactly how I want it to go. It's an interpretation. The problem is, hopefully I have it. Sometimes I don't even have it in my head. But if I'm becoming a serious musician, I have it in my head, but what good does that do you? That does you no good at all. It's no good until I put it out into the world of sound. So now my practicing is starting to make sense. I have the exact same process that I have in the dart game. I have a map in my head. This is what it should sound like. So we don't really have a word for that, but I'm sort of visualizing. I'm audioizing what it should sound like. I then am attempting to play it in that way, like tracing. Like tracing, you could have a print of the Mona Lisa, put a piece of tracing paper, and you could trace over it, and you could see where you got it right and where you got it wrong. Through my playing, I'm tracing my own interpretation. At the same time, I'm listening to what I do. Did I do it well, or did I do it badly? Did I really achieve what I wanted to achieve? The problem is that, as many of you raised your hands, that you played an instrument at some point in your life. So you all know that it's hard. And when you're doing a task that's hard, it takes a lot of brain power. It takes a lot of work. And that means you don't have a whole lot of brain power left over to listen to what's coming out. So there's this struggle to come up with the interpretation, to perform the interpretation, and to listen back and see where did I nail it and where did I mess up? And this is why musicians 
practice for hours and hours and hours a day because this stuff is not easy. It takes a lot of work. I have some students here, I think they would agree that it's a grueling process. But it's through repetition of trying to achieve a goal that musicians get good. And as you know, some musicians get incredibly good. And when they play, you are moved because they actually are creating in the world of sound what they want you to hear. It's, you're hearing into their own brain. So that is how we use repetition as a tool to try to become greater artists. Of course, in the process, we're also using repetition to hone our craft. So the fact that I want my note to go ba and have a nice attack and then a decay, that doesn't mean I can do it. So I have to do that over and over and over and over again. So if you wonder why do people say that pianists practice nine hours a day and it takes years and 10,000 hours, you're starting to maybe get a little glimpse into what's actually going on in that little practice room of ours and why it can be very enjoyable or not so enjoyable to listen to a particular musician play. So now on to repetition in a piece of music. So again, let's step into a little bit of a metaphorical world and then take that across and look at what it is in music. I want to tell you a very simple story. <coughs> so I'll make up a story. I have two friends and their names are Billy and Jimmy. Billy really likes basketball. Although he didn't play basketball, Billy started watching it as a young child with his dad and he continued watching. He played a little bit at school and Billy liked to practice shooting and uh, he especially liked it when his favorite team got into the Final Four and it was very exciting. Okay, that's my story about Billy. Jimmy, on the, on the other hand, was a football fan. He loved the power of the players. He loved the quickness. He loved the fact that he could go get a soda in between plays. He thought the equipment of the game was exciting and the ferociousness. Okay, so if that were a piece of music, it doesn't seem like there would be very much repetition in that piece of music. But there is something that was repeated quite a bit. So. Billy, blah, 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 Billy this, Billy, blah, 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 Billy this, Billy, Billy. Jimmy, blah, 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 Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. It's like the Gary Larson cartoon, what you say to your dog and what your dog hears. <laughs> it's a good dog, Fido. That's right, sit down, Fido. That's it, that's it. And now put your paw up, Fido, and what Fido hears is blah, 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 Fido, blah, 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 Fido. So, when a, mu when a composer is trying to tell a story, they need these anchor points. This is about Billy. This is a section about Billy. So it has maybe a theme that represents Billy. And then if it immediately goes to a different kind of music, then we, we're talking about something else. If we then go to a different kind of music, we're talking about something else. So we get a story that's not about Billy and the things he did from the time he was three till he was 18. We get a story with a sentence about Billy, a sentence about Tara, a sentence about Hector, a sentence about John, and so forth, and we don't get any kind of context or understanding of Billy. So a musical theme could be thought of as a character, and through repetition, sometimes with change, and sometimes without change, we get a broader understanding of that character. If there were no repetition, we couldn't, the music would be unlistenable because we wouldn't get to know it and recognize that one particular character. So there's a kind of music, musical form, called sonata form, which probably a lot of you have heard of, perfected by composers like Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. And it's a way that composers have to write a piece of music that has length to it that is, and, but that tells a story that you can follow. And here's how they do it. In sonata form, you start with a theme. And that's called, for lack of a better name, A. And then you explore A. And that comes to an end, and you explore the next theme. That's B. Now, in typical sonata form, you have a section with A and a section with B. And then you come to a musical repeat sign. 
That means go back to the beginning and do it again. Now, why would you have that repeat sign? We've already gotten it. The answer is that music is very abstract, very abstract. And when you hear things once, you don't have it. You just don't have it. You hear it again and again and again, you start getting it. We need to hear things many times. Pop composers understand this. We get a small number of ideas, they're repeated, and the pop songs that are really popular, we like them from the very first time because they have great material, not much of it repeated, so we get it right there. But with a piece that's going to be long and developed, we need those repetitions of that complicated material. So there's our story. Here's Billy, here's what he did. Here's Jimmy, here's what he did. You didn't quite get it? That's okay. Here's Billy again, remember? And here's Jimmy. <coughs> now we go across that repeat sign, and now we have a section called the development section. And the development section is this, just what it sounds like. Things happen to these different themes. They get transformed, they get changed, they interact, they might battle. Anybody who's ever read a novel would understand that this is like, this is very novelistic, this is storytelling. And then at the end, we have what's called the recapitulation, which is very, well, obviously the recapitulation restates what we had at the beginning. But now we're hearing it, not for the first time, but with an understanding of where, where this material can go. And so it sounds different because we have new knowledge. So composers use repetition as a way of guiding us through the story in a way that we can actually understand it, and then taking us back and letting us see the beginning again and, and getting it. It's a way of giving us an understanding. So when you listen to a Mahler symphony that's an hour and 20 minutes long, that's a lot of music. And yet, you can go into that world and understand it because the parts are so skillfully repeated that you can understand the storytelling that's not in words but in music and therefore abstract. Yet you grasp it. So composers use repetition as a way of bringing the listeners with them on the voyage. And you use repetition as a way of being able to check back in and understand and enjoy a piece of music. So the music that we have tonight, we're going to um, hear about it from Steve Loranga in just one second. Um, it's a very repetitive kind of music. And I just want to briefly say that another way that composers and um, certainly contemporary composers have explored this quite a bit, but also um, some styles of music around the world have explored this, is the idea of music that is almost hypnotic, that draws you into a new kind of a mental state that's restful and stimulating at the same time. And you'll find this kind of music all over the world. I'm a big fan of a kind of Pakistani music called Kawali, and performers of Kawali um, which is a, a devotional kind of uh, music. They get a groove going, they improvise bits of text from the Quran, and they create a groove, and they somehow are tapping into the audience, and they have a sense of when the audience, when they have them. And when they have them, they kick the tempo up, they move it a little faster. And now they work at that tempo. They work and they work. When they have them, they kick it again. And it's a way of bringing their audience. It's a different kind of a development that uses repetition, almost like a raw form of repetition with not much else, to bring an audience and get them into a state of devotional frenzy. So um, Steve, why don't you come tell us what gamelan music is all about, and then we will hear a performance. I'd like to thank these musicians very much. This is the largest group we've had at Soundwaves. And um, you just see this stuff, and you need to hear it. So we will hear it. Thank you. Okay, so I want to say thanks first to Professor Grabois for the opportunity to play here. Um, and the instruments that you see over here, they're all, all of them collectively are called a Javanese gamelan. And these are actually not even this is only a part of the, the full ensemble that we have here at the University of Wisconsin. So this is about a fourth of all of the instruments that are part of it. Um, and the, the instruments come from, from central Java in, in Indonesia. Um, 
And I don't want to, I always have to assume that people, that not everybody knows all about Indonesia. And so some of you probably do know a lot about it, but um, some people usually don't. Um, so Indonesia is actually the fourth largest population of any country in the world. And Java isn't the biggest island in Indonesia, but it's the most populated. And it has about 120 million people who live in um, an island that's about the size of California. So it's even though we don't hear about it in the news a lot, it's actually one of the major kind of human centers in the world. Um, and as far as this gamelan that we have at the University of Wisconsin has been here since 1976. Um, and at that time, it was already, it had a previous owner. So it was bought, already, already used. I don't know the whole story of, of where it came from. Um, but it's, it's probably about 50 or 100 years old. Um, and it's since 1976, it's been, the group has been continuously active. Um, and we, have, we actually, this, this performance today is actually um, kind of a warm up for a, another performance that we're going to have on April 26th. So I, I want to mention that. So it's Saturday, April 26th. If you, if you enjoy seeing this, um, you can see us play again at 3 p.m. in the, the Humanities Building over there in the, the hall called Mills Hall. Um, let me just get into a couple of key aspects of, of, of Javanese gamelan music um, that have to do with repetition. Um, first one is, is the, uh, actually first I'll just talk about the sound in general. There's a lot of layering of sound. Uh, most, most pieces that are composed for gamelan have a sort of a basic melody and then you see that there's several different kinds of instruments here. Um, the other instruments often will, will play different techniques around the, the basic melody. So you'll hear You'll hear a, a basic melody, and then you'll hear other things that are filling it in. Um, and the second point that I want to make is that most compositions, that at least ones that have meter in for, for gamelan, there are some that are, are free rhythm that don't necessarily repeat. But um, most of the compositions that, that do have meter and have are organized into gong cycles. They could be eight beats long or 32 beats long, but they'll repeat every time. And in some pieces, I don't want to say that every, every piece of gamelan music sounds repetitive. Not all of them do. There's some, where, some that play with that form. Um, there's others that kind of emphasize it. Um, and in the, the most repetitive compositions for Javanese gamelan are, are often ceremonial pieces. Um, so you'll have a piece that's just a few beats long that uh, is like a, a riff that just goes over and over again. And that's actually kind of what this piece is like tonight, except that but we'll get into the, what's special about it in a minute. Um, those pieces, so, yeah, for example, at weddings, or at, there, there's a piece when the, when the bride and groom meet that is really repetitive. Um, it's just, just one riff that goes over and over. And, and oftentimes, the effect of that repetition is, is like Professor Garboy was saying, it's a, an intensification of, of affect. In that case, it's people talk about it in the piece of music kind of representing this cosmic unification that happens in a wedding. Um, so the, the piece that we're going to play tonight is called Giro Hendro, and it's, it's sort of a ceremonial piece as well. It's these pieces that are in this type, it's a, a genre of piece called the Giro, um, are usually used to welcome guests at, a, at, an, at a, an event. And, the, and this Giro Hendro is actually kind of the most, it's, it's sort of the paragon actually of, the, of this particular form. Hendro is um, a Javanese pronunciation of, of Indra, which is the god, one of the Hindu gods, who is the, the god of, of the heavens. Um, and this piece usually is, is performed as, as the, as in certain parts of Java, it's performed as the first piece in, the, in a night of a, a long performance. Um, so some people, you could say that it's sort of an invocation of, of sort of a sacred feeling. Or not, a lot of people don't feel it. There's, the history of Java is pretty complicated in, in terms of religion. So some people would feel that way, and other people would not. Um, and this, this piece is from a part of Java that, that is far away from the, the courts, um, which are, were tended to be the ones that chronicled history. Um, so this piece has been around for at least 100 years. It's kind of, we can only really go from oral memory of, of, music, you know, of old musicians and what they can remember people telling them when they were young. But this piece is known to have been around for well over 100 years. And it could be much older than that. It could be four or 500 years old. Um, the last time that there was a Hindu kingdom in, in Java was, was about 400 years ago. So a lot of people believe that it's that old, but no, no one really knows. 
Um, and finally, just for the listening context for this, um, I want to let you know that it's f about 15 minutes long. So you have to be ready to, to pace yourself in your listening. Um, and, it's, and, and it begins actually from a, a, a repeating phrase that's only four beats long. Initially, it'll just take us about three seconds, three or four seconds to play through that phrase. But the whole kind of structure of the piece is that it expands and gets, lo gets longer and longer um, until we find, we, when it gets to the longest point, it takes about two minutes to get through this melody that initially is just a couple of seconds long. Um, and, and so it's one of the things that you can listen for is, is you know, how we're filling up all of that space. Um, then we, we, once we get expanded, then, then it, we, there's actually a small kind of change in texture that happens when it gets completely expanded to the longest form. So you can try to l listen for that. And then once that little change happens in the, in the treatment, it sort of goes from being more melodic in the first half to being a little bit more rhythmic emphasis in the second half. Um, then we start condensing it again, and we get, eventually get back to the short form. Um, and one last point I want to make is that the, this, piece, this particular piece has a really stable melody. So it just is, starts on a tone that's kind of in the middle, and then it goes up, and then it goes back to the middle tone, and then it goes down, and then it goes back to the middle tone. And then that just repeats over and over again. Um, so there's a real feeling of stability in that. I think you'll probably pick up on that. Even though it even though it's kind of has a powerful sound, it's, it's very stable. And um, as far as the meaning of this piece, again, there's, there's really no consensus on what it is. But uh, people who do want to comment on it will often say that it, it has something to do with um, evoking some of the grandeur of, of Indra or of the, the heaven that Indra lives in, which is um, in Javanese theater, it's often described as a, a sort of a, a, a grand palace, a really vast palace that's, that's um, you know, perfect in every, every little ornament. So, so if, we, if we play this well, then hopefully that's what you would get a sense of. Also, please stick around. There's um, some dessert and coffee out there afterward, and come talk to us. Thank you.